Hello and welcome to Cambridge 02139. Tonight is a very special night. I'm here with Juan Perez Mercader. And Juan Perez, you know, has been asking some of the questions that some people maybe would even think they're not, you know, part of science or they would be in the boundary of science, which are these questions of origins and is the question of the origins of life. So could you fill us a little bit in with what are kind of like the theories that exist about the origins of life and what are the evidence that points into those directions? What, what's the state of the field at this moment? Well, we know very little about the actual origins of life or the origin of life on Earth. We don't even know if there was one origin or if there were several origins. We don't know if life originated on Earth or if it originated elsewhere and then came here. We don't know if life is in other places in the universe. We only know one example of life so far, and that is life as we know it in this planet. If you were to look, for example, at the history of planet Earth, and you were to represent the 4.5 billion, American billion years, that the planet Earth has been going on, this is the origin right here, and this is today. So between here and here, there are 4.5 billion years. You have to come all the way to here, more or less, to it's 3.7 billion years ago, if you are very optimistic, to actually find signs of matter that was organized like a living system. Okay, so the oldest fossils we know are about 3.6, 3.7, 3.8 at the very most billion years old. Many things happen between here and here. And many things happen, and here we are today as the expression the, of the evolution of what was going on here. The evolution of the chemistry that was going on here, and an exchange of information with the environment in which, in which that chemistry was going on. We know very little, Cesar, about what happened between here and here. We know very little, and we have conjectures. We have conjectures which are informed on what we know about life today. We know that a living system is a system that self-reproduces, is a system which is capable of taking energy from the outside and converting it into other types of energy and information, and it's a system which is capable of evolving by adapting to the conditions in the environment. There are many other properties. You know, I've just mentioned three which are very central. So the theory is that people propose that people uh, work with to understand the origins of life are theories which tend to explain those processes. But to explain, to explain those processes not as separate processes, but as processes which together made something bigger than the parts, something where the sum total was bigger than the parts, okay? an emergent phenomenon. We believe that the first, uh, we believe that uh, mm, there was, at the beginning on the Earth, there were some complex chemicals. I should, uh, I should also add that life is the most complex phenomenon we know so far in the universe. Okay? So we know that there were complex chemicals probably at the beginning of the formation of our planet. We don't know the nature of those chemicals. We can say things about the nature of those chemicals and based on that we can conjecture about the chemistry that there was here. We can also say things about how that chemistry evolved and we begin to make a statements about where life could have emerged. For example, and I know that I'm giving you a very long-winded yeah. uh, answer, <laughs> but, I, but, but, I, but I know you're going to get to examples. So. That's yeah. right. <laughs> okay. So, it, it, so based on those conjectures, we can think of several scenarios. We can say that since this chemistry cannot be too hot for the origins of life, because otherwise it would be all uh, broken up into simple pieces. Or it cannot be too cold, because otherwise there would not be enough energy to actually make the reactions happen and all that. So we believe, and this study with, uh, uh, with people in the 19th century, we believe that maybe in a little warm pond, life started. We don't know what happened but maybe in a place where it wasn't too cold, too hot. Then you can make conjectures as to what materials could there be there. Okay? Other people believe that you need a special chemistry, very special chemistry, and you also need a very 
high free energy gradient. So people say, ah, say in chimneys, in, in, you know, in smokers, in the depths of the oceans, there is, a, there is a huge free energy gradient. Maybe there, that's where it started, okay? So people conjecture on the basis of environment and on the basis of chemistry where life might have begun. And, and what would you say would be the defining moment in which you start calling something or, you know, a system alive? That's a really tough question, okay? I personally would call it a, a system, I would call a system alive if it had those three properties, properties I just mentioned before. It's a system that self-replicates. It's a system that is capable of interacting with the environment to somehow harness energy and transform the energy into other types of energy, other classes of energy, mechanical, and so on and so forth, and also to produce its own materials, in other words, to metabolize, and at the same time handle information. Information's, information is a very important piece of living systems. And, assist, and the third property that the system must have for me to call it alive is that when it reproduces, it's capable of passing on to its brethren, to its children, passing on part of the information that it's been gathering through its history. In other words, it evolves by adapting to the environments in which the system is. That's what, if those three things happen in a system, I would call that system a life. So then, is life the property of organisms or is property of an ecosystem in that case? Organisms make part of an ecosystem, okay? What you just, the comment you just made leads to another very interesting question. Can you have a single species which is alive and have it survive? My belief, and I emphasize, I don't know if you saw my passing the, the, the yellow marker when I said belief, <laughs> I said belief, and I marked it in yellow. My belief is that you could have probably some systems which would be capable of surviving by themselves with, without the help of any other like system. An autotrophic systems. Some autotrophic systems, yeah. Systems which are capable of uh, you know, feeding in an, in an environment and not needing anyone else to actually feed them any parts, not need, symbi not need any symbiosis with anyone else. And ecology is a very complex manifestation of symbiosis of various types. So, so then, but we, we do not observe many autotrophic systems. Most actual today. organisms live, live in, in ecologies. Well, why do you think actually that that's the case? You know, is it that the autotrophic systems disappeared? Or is it that you know, life uh, in ecosystems was able to defeat you know, autotrophic life? Why do you think that we observe now uh, this? So few autotrophic yeah, exactly. systems. The reason why, it, why we see today a more auto, a non autotrophic than a autotrophic systems, and in fact, I think we see very few, okay, is because life has evolved, in fact, has co evolved with the planet. And living, making a living all by yourself is very hard. It's easier to make a living if someone else gives you pieces or gives you parts that you need. We are a very good example of that. I mean, we need parts that, that others manufacture for us, okay, like we eat meat, we eat plants and so on. So th those guys manufacture for us and we are at the top of the pyramid, okay. Uh, autotrophic systems, I think, that they uh, can survive because of the simple reason, because of, of, the, of the reason that they are the simplest manifestation of the basic principles of physics and chemistry that would actually lead to a system with enough complexity so as to have the properties of a living system. But once you have those guys, those guys will begin to interact with a very complex, say, physical ecosystem. Imagine the following scenario right here, okay? Some autotrophic systems, they would begin to interact with uh, minerals that they have nearby, and they will need to adapt to new minerals. As they adapt to new minerals, they will change into something else, because they will have to change, to, ad to adapt their chemistry to the new, to the new minerals to the new irregularities, to the new inhomogeneities in the medium. And soon you will have new species that will develop and will adapt to better circumstances. And life will progress adapting to the environments in different conditions. So then when we're thinking about you know, the, the theories of the origin of life, if you open in any book or most popular books that 
touch on the topic on, on one page or another. They, for example, they describe the RNA uh, first well, based theory. That's, that's one theory that is very popular. And tell us a little bit what that theory is about and, and, and what evidence is for and against that view of the world. Well, evidence for or evidence against there isn't as of now for any of these theories. But that's a very rational theory which is based on something very important. And that is to say that if you had RNA, then there is a path, a rational path, based on observations we've made that will lead you from RNA to DNA. Okay? If you were to assume that you had RNA, then you could lead to proteins, and then you could lead to DNA as a way of somehow encrypting all the information about proteins and to the life we know today. We believe that this is based on a very basic property of RNA which was discovered in the 80s, and which is that it is autocatalytic. It means that RNA has the ability to catalyze its own production. So if you were to assume that there was RNA first, then you could construct a series of steps which are logical, which are more or less based on, exp on observations we make today, which would actually allow you to design a believable, scientifically believable story of how the evolution took place from the RNA first uh, cells, or whatever they were, into what we uh, see today. There are experiments that are being uh, done a few miles from here by colleagues of mine who are trying to actually encapsulate uh, RNA inside vesicles in such a way that they are trying to reproduce somehow to build some sort of uh, primeval uh, cell of some kind. So far, there is no success. But even if we had the success to actually do that, to generate a, an RNA-based cell, so to speak, we would need to answer a very, very, very basic question which underlies this model or this idea about the origins of life. What about RNA? What is the origin of, the origins of RNA? RNA is a very complex molecule. It's very non-trivial. It's a, an extremely non-trivial molecule. Where and how did it evolve? How was it formed? We have no clue. Okay? And that's a mystery. But the way science progresses is by asking questions and then finding walls. Once you find a wall and you identify the wall, you try and penetrate that wall. So can you actually use RNA within some vesicles who, which self-reproduce, which are able to metabolize and are able to adapt. If you could, then you would go one step backwards and say, why did RNA form? Why does it have the properties it does? What would be other theories that would be competing with this RNA first based theory? RNA first is the theory which is now considered to be the most, or the RNA world based theories are the theories which are considered to be the best theories. There are the best theories, well, they are considered to be the best theories because are the theories which allow you to have a more logical, scientifically based narrative. You know that science is, in some, this type of science is in some sense like a narrative of some kind. Okay, it's associated with the history. Yeah. And so, you know, and uh, there are other theories about how other types of uh, forms, simple forms of life form. For example, there are theories based on the nine steps of Wachtehäuser. Wachtehäuser is somebody who proposed in the uh, early 90s an autocatalytic world in which there are nine steps, all of which have been shown in the laboratory to be feasible. Okay, uh, more about it in 30 or 40 seconds. Okay, nine steps which can, uh, you could link them, and if you were to link them, you could generate something which was autotrophic. Okay? And, but unfortunately, although those nine steps, each of them has independently been shown to be correct, that the conditions under which uh, these steps happen do not really match each other. So that means that, and I'm making this up now to simplify things, okay? That means that, say, the first step happens at 200 atmospheres. The second step would need to happen in, say, the next minute or two minutes or whatever, short time and it happens at the, well atmosphere. The environmental conditions are very, very different. Very disparate. Ah. Okay, so, but there are, these are theories which uh, people handle. 
Uh, what I think will happen is that mm, we will understand the basic principles that lead to self-organization of systems which are based on chemistry and which are capable of self-reproducing, are capable of metabolizing and generating its own parts as well uh, uh, information and at the same time are able to actually adapt. I think we will be able to understand the principles why this happens and once we have that we will be able to understand, identify the environments into which life may have formed and that is why identifying the environments where this chemistry could have happened is important for us for the origins of life and because we need to identify those environments we are trying to look for life elsewhere in what planetary systems in what planetary environments could life have emerged for example let's look at Mars okay Mars in many regards today is quite different from Earth but 3.5 billion years ago 3.7 billion years ago or 4 billion years ago the difference was not so big and we know that from the observations that we have made recently of the red planet where we have sent rovers and we are sending rovers this year we will send a rover Mars Science Laboratory to the surface of Mars in the forthcoming years we'll be sending more instrumentation to Mars and but what we know the information we're gathering tells us that there are where environments there might have been environments of Mars which could have been precisely the type of environments we may have needed for life to emerge on Earth. So we're looking for places where those environments might have happened and we're looking for signs of life associated with those environments and try to you know somehow correlate those with what we see on Earth. Unfortunately the fossil record on Earth from this time of uh, this time in the history of the Earth is very deteriorated, has changed quite a bit. It's gone through huge processes of change due to aging and all that, and we don't have such good data. But we are trying to combine the environmental data on Mars with environmental data on fossils on the Earth and see if we find some fossils on Mars as well. So one of the arguments that is made, you know, or that you hear often about the, the origins of life is like we say that it would be something that would be so unexpected. But at the same time, you know, more modern literature, you know, says there is Stu Kaufman's book, At Home in the Universe, that mm -hmm. kind of like says, we the expected. So, so what do you think that life, it's, it's a common phenomenon in the universe? And if so, why life would be a common phenomenon? Or, or if you think that way, the same, the same question. This is, the, that's a wonderful question again. And it's a question that I, and the answer to that question, the one I subscribe to, Okay, I'll say that first, and then I will argue, is that life with a capital L, the one on Earth, is an example of life with a lowercase l, which, there must, which must exist in many places in the universe. Why do I say that? If, when we began talking, I said that we, so far, we only know one example of life, which is life on this planet. How come suddenly, I say that there should be life in many places. I'll tell you why. All life we know on Earth is based on a very important and universal phenomenon, which is chemistry. We do know that the chemistry that works on Earth is the same chemistry that works anywhere we look in the universe. So up until 1995, we had a notion that there should be other Earths, that there should be other planetary systems but we had never seen one until 1995, okay? We conjectured that there should be planetary systems in certain type of, uh, around certain type of stars and so on and so forth, but we didn't have, and we did computer simulations and, you know, built models and so on, and they predicted that, but we had never actually seen the, uh, in detail anything like a planetary system, although we saw the beginnings of planetary systems when they put new corrected glasses to the Hubble Space Telescope in 1992, we began to see what they call proplets, protoplanetary disks, okay, which are the harbingers of planetary systems. But we didn't expect to see so many as we are seeing today. Today, Cesar, we know that the Earth is probably a very common type of planet in the universe. We do know for sure that there are 
millions of planetary systems in the universe. A year ago, NASA launched a mission called Kepler, which is focusing on a very small piece of the sky and is discovering thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of planetary systems. Okay? Looking at a very tiny portion of the sky in our galaxy. The universe contains, our galaxy contains of, on the order of 10 billion, American billion stars. In the universe there are of the order of 10 billion galaxies. So there is a huge number of possibilities that there should be planetary systems like us. Life is based on chemistry. Chemistry as it operates here we know is the same that operates in other planetary systems, first in other planets, in other planetary systems, in other galaxies. How do we know that if we never went there? Oh, because, because we observe and we make the hypothesis that what we see can be understood with what we do in the experiments here. And then we understand the things we see. So therefore we infer from that that oh, the chemistry that works here must work there. So if the chemistry that works here is what generated life 3.5, 3.6, 3.7 or however billion years ago on this planet, then given the same conditions it should have generated the same type of phenomena. After all chemistry when you mix for example hydrogen with oxygen in the same conditions it always does the same thing. So then you say hmm but what about the complexity of the chemicals that make up a planet? So you say let's look at that. So you build telescopes that look at say molecular clouds out of which uh, stars and planetary systems form and then you begin looking at the chemicals there and you begin looking at the chemicals there and you begin to discover a huge chemical diversity, a huge chemi chemical richness and you begin to look at the spectra and you see that they are populated by huge numbers of complex chemicals and you begin to see that some of those complex chemicals have pathways that can lead to the chemicals that we believe would be important for something like the RNA world, for example. So you begin to see that there is a narrative that by looking at the basic laws of the universe, by, under, by looking at chemistry, physics, by appealing to common sense like what works here works there, by appealing to the notion and the hypothesis of universality, and by appealing to the fact that you see many features of the universe which repeat over and over in different parts of the universe including here and which were important when the earth formed and life emerged you begin to see that there is a coherent story that leads you to believe that life is probably a consequence of the evolution of the universe. So then you say so are you telling me that as the universe was formed life was already written in the history of the universe? I am saying yes and you then say, so all life must be like here? And I say, no. The reason is because life is contingent. That is to say, remember when we were talking about autotrophs? We began to say that they had to adapt to the conditions. The same, th the same thing would happen else elsewhere. So evolution is what generates this wonderful diversity we see in life here and probably elsewhere. You say that we live in a universe that is pregnant with life all over the place and that life was implied you know by the chemistry and by the laws of the universe. Now one question would be uh, is there going to be interplanetary exchanges in the future? What, do you ever think about that? Do you think in, in those dimensions? I don't think we are visited by people from other planets or from other galaxies or anything like that. I just don't believe in any of that. Okay. But I do think that there must be life in many other places. We have not seen any life yet which is not life on Earth. And we have not seen yet any life on Earth which is not the one that naturally appeared in our planet. So we understand very little about life even though we talk and say that it, could be a, it must be a consequence of the evolution of the universe but we need a lot of pieces in that story, okay? I think that there should be probably life in many places. In order to develop a very complex life form as we are with, uh, with uh, the ability to think, the ability to 
uh, have some sense of uh, transcendence and all that. In this planet, it took about 3.5 billion years for it to develop, okay? Maybe other forms also have consciousness, okay? But the ones who have really manipulated things are us, and it's 3.5 billion years since uh, we are here. So uh, there could be places, so that means that you need to have stability. There could be many places. The sun is a very common star, okay? And the earth probably is a very common type of planet. So there could be many places in the universe and many things like this could have evolved. With the science we have, with the technology we know up to date, we cannot send matter. We may be able to send some parts of information, but we cannot send matter and real information at a speed faster than the speed of light. So we're very limited. So receiving visits, I don't think it will happen. However, who knows what history and what scientists will discover in the next five minutes or in the next five years or in the next five centuries. They might discover many things, just like Columbus left Spain or the, the, the Vikings left uh, Northern Europe and came here and then, or Columbus came and then uh, discovered it and Columbus had a technology which allowed him to really spread it, which had to do with the printing press. Columbus spread his discoveries through Gutenberg's uh, invention of the, of the printing press, okay? That's why he became so well known so fast. The others couldn't do it, didn't do it that way, didn't have that technology. So who knows what scientists will discover in a few years that will make us, allow us to travel elsewhere. In, in a regular statistical physics class, they always tell you about, which is sort of like this thermal, thermal death of the universe which means that at some point sort of like the universe is going to be in equilibrium, the entropy is going to be maximized, and there's nothing interesting ever going to be there. I've always been a little bit in conflict with that because I'm a big believer of self-organization, and as you know, the system keeps on going, you know, usually it's not that it equilibrates, it sort of like makes pockets of order that are really highly interesting. And I wanted to, to, to hear your comments about it. Have you ever thought about now mm -hmm. sort of like, will there be an end to life if the universe keeps on expanding? Do, do you think that this thermal death of the universe is something that you can accept as a universal truth because of the second law of thermodynamics? Or, you know, it's a bit of an oversimplified theory that has not taken self-organization seriously enough. What, what are your thoughts on, on that? I have thought a lot about its cathology, okay, the future and the, of the universe and the future of life and so on. I started my scientific, my formal scientific career working on proton decay, okay? Some of the first calculations on proton decay, we were involved in them. And at that time we were saying that protons had a lifetime of at least 10 to the 32 years, okay? Today we, we have raised the bar a few orders of magnitude. Those were theoretical calculations based on what was known till then. At that time, this is the late 70s, early, early 80s. And I have thought about the fact that the universe is uh, 10 to the 10 years old, that order of magnitude. So 10 to the 32, 10 to the 10. So what happens? There is a huge difference. And then what happens afterwards? So I have read about it, thought about it, and done some informal calculations about it. You know, back of the envelope, never published anything, but thought a lot about it. And I am, like you, a firm believer in self-organization. I think that there are some principles in the universe that allow matter and energy, same thing, to somehow self-organize and adapt to the circumstances and the conditions in the universe. I believe that a lot was set when the universe was formed. The boundary conditions of the universe were, had contained a huge amount of order. And that huge amount of order gets, you know, somehow re-elaborated on as circumstances change, as matter reorganizes, as clumping due to gravity or due to the presence of fluctuations, which originally were quantum fluctuations that happened in the universe when it was too sm very small. And then those have left imprints in different parts of the universe. And then there's chaotic dynamics that takes place and there are 
as you very well put it, little pockets of uh, energy that uh, free energy gradients that move around and they generate order and uh, that generate disorder but then you know so I believe in reprocessing of matter I believe that with time the universe will evolve definitely the earth is going to disappear in five billion years or so as the Sun grows and the matter that makes us now will probably transform into, well, probably no, will transform into many things else. But that matter will keep reprocessing, except that as time evolves, and if the universe is only one universe, it's not a multiverse, but it's a universe, only one universe. As time progresses, then we will little by little cool. And we will go into different stages in which you have different type of black holes that will be forming. And eventually, we will have a very cold neutrino and photon filled universe. Neutrinos are neutral. Photons are neutral. And for the most part, except when you manipulate them a lot, they, are, they don't interact with themselves. Okay? You need really high density of photons for, in order for nonlinear aspects of electrodynamics to take place. Okay? And you need huge amounts of vacuum polarization for that to take place. But so the most probable is that we, and this is what I believe, is that eventually there will be a very, very cool, in the sense of temperature, a very cool universe with no structure in it in 10 to the 120 or so years from now. And that is what I believe, using Hawking radiation and a number of things that people have postulated that might exist. That's the picture that you arrive at, and that's what I subscribe. Now you are, you're here at Harvard, and, and you are starting um, a, a big lab, you know, searching for, for, for many things. Origins of life may be one of them. So I, I want to know, what was your trajectory? Like, tell me a little bit about like, your life, like, from your undergrad on, kind of like, where did you go to undergrad, and then where you go to grad school, and, and how your life evolved from, you know, someone that was a young, curious, you know, individual to, you know, a scientist running a lab with many people and, you know, exploring all these interesting questions. Well, it's been a very, very a privileged life that I've had. Even though I was born in a socially low-level family, we were not very poor or anything like that, but we were not affluent. And, but I had a very good education at home. My parents taught me how to speak Spanish, English, and French. By age two and a half, I could speak three, the three languages. I, I, they taught me classical literature. They taught me a Renaissance literature at home. My brother and my sister taught me how to read mathematics and to, how to write mathematics. I could do a little bit of differentials by age six and all that. They taught me how to do chemistry experiments. So I was very, very, very fortunate in having a wonderful family. I was the youngest of three children. And my brother was 11 years older than me, my sister eight years older than me. They both took very good care of me. My mother did too and my father did too. We read poetry, we read prose, we read many things. We listened. It was in Spain, in southwestern Spain, where we were forced to live in a, special, in a town in southwestern Spain. We couldn't live anywhere we wanted. We had to live there for whatever reasons. And people were very nice to me. I was a, a very awake kid, OK? <laughs> uh, people were extremely generous to me all the time. So I benefited from that. Then I went to a university in, in Spain, southwestern Spain, the only university. I grew up in a dictatorship. So you couldn't go, most people could not go to a university, and the ones who could go to a university, they could not go to a uni unless there were very special circumstances, which meant that you were connected to some parts of the oligarchy and so on and so forth. You could not go to uh, any university. You, could ha you, ha you were forced to go to university. I was very fortunate to have to go to a university the most uh, in Seville. So I went to the University of Seville, where the, bar the barber of Seville and Carmen and all those guys, and um, Americo Vespucci and many others uh, came, uh, went through there. Okay, so uh, not the University of Seville, but the city of Seville. 
And so I went there, and I had very good teachers who let me go in and out of the labs whenever I wanted. I could go to the library anytime I wanted. I was given the opportunity to lecture my colleagues, my student colleagues, two years ahead of me and two years below me. And we, had, we all were very interested. And we had a few very good teachers in that university. Then I went to the University of Barcelona, where I started thinking. I didn't have a passport because I had not finished my... my and that was still undergrad or was grad school? Or? That was after I finished my undergrad in, in, in Seville. Then I had to finish my military service. Otherwise, I could not get out of Spain, could not get a passport. It was quite clear to me that I had to leave Spain if I wanted to do serious science. Okay, and the, it's a long story to say why, okay? but I, yeah. it was quite clear to me. And um, I even wrote to Heisenberg. Yeah. Ah. When, I was, when I was in my third undergrad year, there were five years in Spain, I wrote to Heisenberg, Dear Professor Heisenberg, <laughs> I am a, st a student in Seville, and I have found out I've been looking at a problem in a book, and I have found out uh, something about the representations of the Lorenz group. And I wonder, if, so I told him some things, and then I wrote to him about, I, I wrote a letter to him asking him about unified theories of physics. I knew that he had written some theories which they were not very good, but he had written them on unif unified field theories. Okay, and I was all confused if it was a field theory that would allow you to convert yourself into light and then travel at the speed of light and rematerialize yourself and so on. So I started looking at something which seemed to be very important for all of this, which was the Poincaré group. So I started studying that and I found some special representations of the Poincaré group which I had not seen in any books. So I wrote to him, since he was an expert exactly. in unified theories, what the hell, I'm going to ask him. So he said that I should uh, look at the work of somebody by name Lochlein or Rafferty. And I didn't know what the hell he meant. So I... Uh, I there was no Google to Google the person. <laughs> not not exactly. any Google, and, in, and the, library, the library in the University of Seville was quite poor. But I did find out that O'Reilly was a name in Ireland. So I wanted to go to Ireland, but I couldn't get my passport because I had not finished my military service. So I spent a year in the University of Barcelona as a teaching assistant while I got my passport, finished my military service and got my passport. Then I went to Ireland and I studied in Ireland for a number of years, two years or so, and got a master's in mathematics and physics. I didn't feel comfortable with the training I had. And then I applied for a Fulbright scholarship. This is 1975. And I got a Fulbright scholarship uh, to come to the United States. And I came, I was told by O'Rafferty, I was told that I should co go to a place called the City College of New York. There were some people there that I should mingle with and learn from them. So that's where I went for my PhD. And I got my PhD from the City College of New York. And then I learned some things about proton decay, grand unification, and all that. And I became extremely interested in bootstrapping physics, meaning doing physics from the mind, inventing things in paper and in formula that would later on be checked experimentally. You know? So make theoretical constructs that would actually be checked experimentally, not just any theoretical construct. So I, be, I developed that, and then I, I wanted to understand a thing called symmetry breaking. So I went to, st and I thought that relativistic bound states played a very important role there. So I went to study relativistic bound states with the person, and I did a postdoc in Louisiana, in Baton Rouge, with a wonderful guy there. So then I went for a little while to Los Alamos. Then my visa had to change, and I went back to Spain. And I found in the mid-'80s, when I came back to Spain, that my country, which I had left in 1973, had changed. And it, it was a wonderful democracy. The guys who were the president of the government, the, many of the people that I saw there were my friends, people I knew. And then I said, what the hell, I can contribute to this. So instead of changing my visa and coming back to the United States, spending some time there, and then coming back to the United States, I decided I would stay in Spain. And I stayed in Spain, and I continued my work. I did work on supersymmetry, superstrings, 
And then I began to consult with Los Alamos National Laboratory by the late 80s. I started the laboratory. I began to see that my interest in uh, the early universe was connected somehow with astrophysics, and I began to be interested in that. I, was, I had the opportunity to generate a laboratory in Spain, which is called Laboratory for Fundamental Physics and Space Astrophysics, in collaboration with the European Space Agency. And then in the Los Alamos National Laboratory in the summers, I met a good cadre of people who were discussing things that had to do with the application of physics to more general phenomena, including geology, including life. Among those people was Jeffrey West, whom you know. And among those people also was Marie Gellman, my buddy, a very good friend and collaborator. We have been working on something for about 12 years. We haven't written a paper. <laughs> and we have a, problem, a very interesting problem that we have solved, but we need to write that paper. But anyway, so we began to think about, especially uh, the three of us at first, and then Marie and myself. Jeff went into his own thing with scaling and all that. But Marie and I kept thinking about origins of life and, and how can life is for this year and so on. And then we began, that became known to NASA. NASA invited us to be involved in the NASA Astrobiology Institute by the late 90s. And then I, decided, I said, why don't we do it? Or a part of it in Spain? And we applied and we actually set up a center for astrobiology in Spain. The idea that I had when I was fortunate enough to create and to fund Spain's National Center uh, or Spain's Center for Astrobiology was that I could develop in that center the theories, the mathematical theories that would describe the physics of life, the principles of life, and establish a connection between physics and the evolution of the universe on the one hand, chemistry and the origins of life on the other hand in planetary environments. And it would allow us to check and see if life elsewhere, if it existed, had the same properties as on Earth. And therefore, I applied the scientific method to life. So I began to develop that. And with time, I had this large, we had this large laboratory. Now it, it employs about 150 permanent people. We are sending instruments to Mars. We're doing many things. I was the, the, the founding director of that center. I started to think about life. And I developed some equations which can be used to describe living systems. And now the work I'm doing in Harvard is setting up a laboratory to express those equations, realize those equations chemically. And that's what I'm doing. So then when, when you have been able to express those equations outside of the board and in the test tube, I'm sure that we will have the pressure to have you back, I hope. I hope it is very soon. <laughs> It was a pleasure to have you, Juan, and you know, thanks for sharing all these wonderful things with us. It's great. Thank you so much. Congratulations, and I really appreciate what you're doing. Yes, sir. Thanks. Thank you.